the voice of God through human beings. Who do we listen to? Today we hear a short excerpt of a longer narrative about two different prophets, Jeremiah and Hananiah. From uh, Jeremiah chapter 28, verses 5 through 9. Then the prophet Jeremiah spoke to the prophet Hananiah in the presence of the priests and all the people who were standing in the house of the Lord. And the prophet Jeremiah said, Amen. May the Lord do so. May the Lord fulfill the words that you have prophesied and bring back to this place from Babylon the vessels of the house of the Lord and all the exiles. But listen now to this word that I speak in your hearing and in the hearing of all the people. The prophets who preceded you and me from ancient times prophesied war, famine, and pestilence against many countries and great kingdoms. As for the prophet who prophesies peace, when the word of that prophet comes true, then it will be known that the Lord has truly sent the prophet. Thank you, Amy. So now we're going to hear from the Gospel of Matthew. And in this passage from Matthew, we're going to hear the end, the very end of a long teaching that Jesus gave to his disciples. Um, and it touches on both welcome and prophets. Whoever welcomes you, welcomes me. And whoever welcomes me, welcomes the one who sent me. Whoever welcomes a prophet in the name of a prophet will receive a prophet's reward. And whoever welcomes a righteous person in the name of a righteous person will receive the reward of the righteous. And whoever gives even a cup of cold water to one of these little ones in the name of a disciple, truly I tell you, none of these will lose their reward. The word of God in our hearing this day. Get myself organized here. I'm not used to standing in this spot. So today, it's 4th of July time, right? It is also United Church of Christ General Synod time that happens every two years. How many of you knew that General Synod was happening this week? This is one of the stoles that I got when I went to General Synod. This was a theme stole from the year that I went. That's why I wore it today. Any of you been paying attention to any of the Synod? Yeah, a little bit. Yeah, yeah. I usually am intensely paying attention to everything that goes on, but then I retired from weekends anyway last <laughs> December, so I gave myself a break this year. But let's, as we proceed today, let's keep all of our connected people in the United Church of Christ and all the churches and all the uh, conferences and everybody and all of our partners in our thoughts, our prayers, as they move through their thoughts and prayers towards action. So today, a welcome tone is set in the Matthew reading. It's a Jesus teaching moment. These verses are at the end of a long teaching session, instructions for a journey as they head out to the countryside to reach out to the Gentiles. You know, that's people different than you. That's the way I think about it whenever I see Gentiles. Different than you, in a different culture than you're used to. He offers his disciples perspectives on the welcome of prophets when you venture into a land that is not your home turf. Here we are in our land here. Well, actually, Spokane tribe's land, but okay, we're sharing it now. in this 4th of July time. We speak of this being about freedom, the 4th of July, in the land of the free. 
this is our founding vision. Yet, this is a complicated story, is it not? Doctrine of discovery, have you heard of that? If we find it, it's ours. American exceptionalism. God called on us over everybody else in the world to save everybody. We're the best. Three-fifths of a person, you've heard of that, right? And I could go on and on and on. No doubt some aspirations of our founding have given opportunity and have truly inspired others to see hope for themselves within the American spirit. Yet, all too often, the American story is framed as God's destiny for a righteous people. God shares special light on us. We are a beacon. The lens that makes this story clear was white, landowning, men, and Christian. They saw themselves, providence they called it, God, to use and civilize others to serve the word of the Lord. The prophet's voice for the sake of the American dream, God's call to an exceptional people in an exceptional land. Step, take, take a step now and look at the prophet's voice in our Hebrew scriptures in Jeremiah 28 that Amy read for us today. Jeremiah is a major prophet, but don't let that scare you because that just means it's a long book. Major prophets in the Hebrew scriptures are the long ones, like Jeremiah and Isaiah and Ezekiel. And the short ones are minor prophets because they didn't write as much. Don't know how they came up with that. Anyway, this is Jeremiah's book we're talking about today. This is also my book because I had a whole course on it in seminary. Don't worry, I don't remember most of it, so <laughs> you're not going to get it all today. <laughs> Enter Hananiah, and now we have dueling prophets today. Jeremiah wearing a yoke, calling for the people to submit to Babylon. Hananiah, no problem, two years and freedom will come and this will all be over. Those are their voices. So I wrote in my notes here, tell the Jimmy Carter story because that would key me to the story. So when I took this class in seminary on Jeremiah, we had to do a project at the end where we took the Jeremiah kind of message as a prophet and we put it into our current times. So this was the late 1970s. Anybody remember that? Time? Some of you do, yeah. And Jimmy Carter was president. So Jimmy was an okay name back then. Um, and uh, so Jeremiah comes out of three years of kind of being totally silent and quiet. And he comes out to, to give this message that we only got a snippet of today about the fact that Babylon, the oppressors, that we shouldn't actually fight them. We should submit to them. Crazy idea. So what I did was I had Jeremiah reemerge after three years in Washington, D.C., and he called a press conference. That's what you do in Washington, D.C. And he announced that we were supposed to, remember, late 70s now, submit ourselves to Russia. I guess that would still work today, right? Soviet Union then. That we should admit ourselves, and that this was the way for us to be faithful to God. And I wrote a whole thing about this. So I wrote out the entire press conference with all the questions from the media. I got it in a box somewhere. Anyway, I was trying to bring that prophetic voice into the moment. And this is not something, whether you're conservative or liberal or whatever you are, that sat well with anybody, this notion. And it surely didn't sit well with people back then that they were supposed to submit themselves to Babylon. So we have dueling voices because Hananiah gives that nice, it's so much more we, what we want to hear. I know it's hard now. I know we're being oppressed now, but I've heard the word of the Lord. And in just a couple of years, everything's going to be broken wide open. Babylon will be defeated. 
we will get all our exiles back and everything will be good. And what's Jeremiah's response in today? Okay, I want that too. But you know, you know a true prophet when you wait and see and if it happens. <laughs> so Jeremiah like, yeah, I, I want it. But really, Hananiah, well, what are you doing here? What's this all about? The dueling prophets that you might be able to see even in our culture today. Who speaks for God in truth? An eternal human quest. Who do you listen to? Who does God speak through in our culture today to you? Who speaks to the reality of love in the great expanse of our multiverses of all creation? Who are your prophets today? Anybody have any? Are you, are you supposed to be quiet? I don't know the rules here. Are, they, are you allowed to talk? See, I wasn't given a set of the rules. <laughs> Oh, there are no rules. Oh, okay. Does anybody have prophetic voices that you listen to today? Pastor Bob. Pastor Bob. Wow. He didn't pay you to say that, did he? <laughs> <laughs> Father Richard Vor. Oh, that's after my own heart. Yes, we got a few nods here. Obama, Barack Obama. Both Obamas, got it. Reverend, oh, William Barber from the Poor People's Campaign. Yes, nice. John, I'm missing that. Was somebody up here? I don't know that person. Okay. <laughs> Amy Richardson. Amy. Renee Brown. I know for some people it's uh, Nadia Boltz Weber who's speaking at UCC Synod this week. Have anybody ever heard, read any of her stuff? Or heard her speak? She's very spunky. Yeah. All right, well, those are a few, a few voices that you listen to out there, that's great. We tend to live in a time where there's a lot of imagery that represents a lot around borders and walls. Building a wall, tearing down a wall. Who's allowed to cross a border under what circumstances? Who shouldn't or maybe no one ever should, right? The battle between hopes and fears is pitting us against each other these days. So we need these prophetic voices to speak through that. The original American dream came to reality in a very small worldview. Our prophetic voices teach us that this dream must be all-inclusive, breaking out of the limitations of any of our fears and our biases. I think that's what we strive to do in the United Church of Christ. I'm not saying arrogantly that we are tons better than anybody else, but at least we see it as something we are striving for. In fact, this is not an American dream. It is God's vision for all peoples and all nations. So why not Hanani Hananiah's story? Jeremiah seems to be saying God wants us under oppression Hananiah sees a new day in two years where we will all be free from oppression. What a good thing. Jeremiah says, I hope so, but I doubt it. I hope I am wrong. So what are some of the keys now, now that you've named some prophetic voices, to a true prophet? Well, I would suggest just a couple, and I think if we had sat down and had a session, we could really add to this with a whiteboard in front of us or something like that. Um, no pipe dreams come from prophets. Seeing the real situation for what it actually is. Discerning God's presence in the midst of the reality and in the people. And being able to see how God is acting. 
Let me say those again. A prophet has no pipe dreams. A prophet sees the real situation for what it is. A prophet discerns God's presence in the midst of the reality and in the people. And a prophet sees how God is acting. So the Jeremiah trap, interpreting Jeremiah's call to submit to Babylon as license to promote that bad, that the bad, that God can turn the bad into something good. We've actually seen that in our politics in recent years where somebody will justify as a Christian voting for someone who has all kinds of morals that they don't like because God is working through them to make things that they do like happen. Have you ever heard that before? It's a really odd thing, but it's really happening in our midst. And this is not really the trap that Jeremiah is in, but it's the one you might at first glance think he is in, telling us that God will work through Babylon and make something good happen for us. But that's not what he's doing. He's seeing the real situation for what it is, is what he's doing. So it's complicated. And don't let people make it simple for you. Don't avoid reality by making it simple. So another connection to that is the whole message that Jesus shows us in the path that he walks, that takes him through death and resurrection. Christians, some of them, have turned Jesus into a commodity. Buy him off the shelf, he's mine. I am now saved because he's my prized possession. Sorry to be cynical, but that's how I see it sometimes out there. But rather, the message of Jesus is not what needs to happen for our personal salvation so I cannot go to that other place. But rather, Jesus shows us how to walk through the reality as it is, even when it is dark, and even in the darkest hour, to find our, th our way through, and promises that that is the best way to everything we ever wanted. That's the Jeremiah way. So I'm with Jeremiah, I'm with Jesus, and I'm with the way that's so hard to choose so often, the complicated way instead of the simple way out. So you may be a citizen of the United States of America, I'm presuming many of you are, with borders that define land and our identity. We need such distinctions to function in society, otherwise it'd be a little crazy. Yet, our more complicated calling is to be citizens of the great expanse. That's what I call it. To embrace our connection, everyone's connection, membership, citizenship, in all creation, from this country to the world, from this world into our universe, and from our universe to the multiplicity of universes. Be about expanding the American dream to include all, but don't stop there. Avoid the simple solutions. Find the prophetic voices that inspire you to work for much more than that. Amen.